So we've sort of been saying modulation, demodulation. Mm. And I'll be honest, when I heard of AM, amplitude modulation, mm. FM, frequency modulation, I understood that that's how the radio works, yeah. but I didn't understand how those things actually work. Yeah. Can you help me understand what modulation actually is? Yeah. So obviously what we're doing is we're getting our audio into our microphone capsule. That then goes through the normal audio process that you're aware of. It'll get pre-amplified to increase that volume coming out of the bottom of the capsule. And then we have to have some way to convert that into a stream that we can broadcast over a radio signal. So if we go back to the, the old days, I won't say the bad old days, but let's go back to the old days of analog wireless microphone systems. We would have a frequency modulation device inside our wireless microphone. And what that is doing is it's literally taking the vocal audio. So if we're doing a singer here, we're taking the vocal audio, and it is modulating the transmitter frequency. So with every wireless device, we have to have a frequency that we tune into. That's the, that's the frequency we're going to transmit at. That frequency then has a specific bandwidth it's allowed to be modulated within. Uh, 200 kilohertz, roughly there. That means we can, with our audio signal, we can modulate the center frequency, which is the frequency we've booked into our receiver and transmitter, and then it will modulate that. It will modulate that frequency based on the audio that is modulating. So that gets modulated, you get that stream, the receiver will pick up that modulated signal. It goes, okay, I know I'm picking up at say, let's say 432 megahertz, and I'm picking up and it's doing this, it's modulating backwards and forwards. That is my audio signal hidden and modulated and encoded inside my transmission frequency. That makes sense. And yeah. that's, I think, an important distinction is that even though your carrier frequency may be 432 megahertz, yeah. the channel itself that that is the the bandwidth yep. that's used to encode that audio signal isn't just at that specific no, frequency. No. So there's a difference between the carrier frequency and the channel. Yep. Can you talk more on that? Well, it is that. It's, it's simply to allow ourselves to have the space to encode the audio into our radio frequency spectrum. Uh, working with national organizations that look after frequency coordination and so on, so the FCC in America uh, and other world regulators. We Many years ago, we came up with a format that said, okay, you are allowed to modulate that within a 200 kilohertz window. So 100 kilohertz from the center frequency, which is your booked frequency, and 100, uh, 100 kilohertz above that frequency. And that literally means that we can then, within that, modulate everything we need uh, and transmit that out. So nice and simple and Everyone follows the rules, so that means you know you can have channel upon channel upon channel with some caveats. Obviously, we'll get into this idea of frequency coordination later. That's a whole different ball game. But because everyone's doing two hundred kilohertz window transmission windows, then we know that we all have that bandwidth to transmit in yep. or to modulate in to transmit. So that limit where we're restricted to plus or minus one hundred kilohertz. Mm -hmm. That has implications on the dynamic range. Yeah, it does. Right? Yeah. And so we basically know that we can't have a wider bandwidth for any given channel than that. Yeah. So we sort of have to work within those those limitations because yeah. that's the law yeah. in a lot of places. Um, there are certain things that we need to make sure on the audio side, that's sort of the law for professional audio. Yeah. Um, and that gets into the CIR, mm. right? The carrier, carrier interference to interference ratio. ratio. Yeah. Yeah. Can you help us just understand briefly what that is? <sighs> That's more down to the technicalities, the the, the, the the physics of transmission. We we need to make sure that whenever we're transmitting, that we have a strong enough signal that the receiver system can pick up. Now, the airwaves are full. Um, it's something that we're fighting, uh, not just us as a wireless mi microphone manufacturer, all the wireless mi microphone manufacturers are out there fighting uh, against the mobile phones because the mobile phone industry is sucking up our airwaves and obviously we still need TV channels being transmitted. So it's getting very crowded. Because of that, what it means is, is the airwaves themselves are very busy and very noisy. To ensure that we have a good enough transmission signal, we have to make sure, depending on the system, depending on the uh, transmission elements we use, that we have a certain 
carrier to interference level. So the carrier always has to be a certain amount higher ratio-wise than the interference that will naturally exist. I mean, even cosmic waves from space will cause interference. It's, it's, a, it's a noisy space. You know that when you tune your car radio. If, you, if you've still got an old analog car radio, when you choose your car radio, you get static between the channels. It just is. Uh, lightning does it. All, uh, loads of things interact to make the noise. As long as we can ensure we have that higher ratio of carrier to interference, we will have good transmission. As soon as they come closer to each other, depending if you're using an analog or digital system, you will get things happening. Uh, analog systems will become noisy and they will begin, you'll begin to hear, oh, I'm getting either too far away from my channel here. And this is normally a distance thing, but that does impact carrier to inter interference ratio. Um, and you begin to get noisy and you begin to go, okay, I'm needing to do something here. I need to either get closer to my receiver or maybe I need to choose a different channel. Digital systems are a little bit different. Digital systems work, 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 stop. But again, it's linked to this carrier to interference ratio because we have to ensure that we have a strong enough signal without static and interference in there that can corrupt the signal we're trying to send, which is why, especially with older analog systems, you do hear that hissing noise begin to come in as your carrier to interference ratio drops. Yeah. Simple as that. And it's kind of intuitive for us as audio people because yeah. we are dealing with signal to noise ratio all yeah. the time. And you can liken it to a tape hiss or a really noisy room. Like yeah. there's noise all around us in audio, yeah. just like there is noise all around us electromagnetically yeah. with RF. Um, but with audio, I guess if at a certain point your signal will just be buried in the noise, yeah. with wireless, it's really important that the machines are able to detect the changes that we're encoding yeah. into these. Yeah. And this sort of gets me back to the three parts of a FM system, mm. the, the carrier, mm -hmm. that's that frequency that is at the center of our channel, yep. the modulation that occurs. So the audio signal modulates that frequency, mm. which represents the audio signal itself. Yep. And then the detection mm. circuit, which is basically the demodulation yep. in that receiving end. As we're talking about the noise, We've got to talk about the squelch just mm. briefly. On a lot of wireless systems, you will find uh, on the receiver, the squelch control. And it's a odd term, but we, we use it. Squelch basically means it's a, no yeah, it's a noise gate. And it literally says everything below this frequency, uh, below this frequency, below this uh, noise level, I will not transmit from. And it comes from the classic situation of, you know, you're using a wireless microphone system and it's on still a relatively noisy channel, but you can use it because you've got greater carrier to interference ratio. And for some reason, the talent turns the microphone off, or the transmitter off. And all of a sudden you get this rush of noise coming through your transmitter because the transmitter's gone, oh, I'm looking for signal, I'm looking for signal. There's signal here, boom, and it'll play out these static burst, which is just irritating as hell. What we can do with the squelch is we can help with that noise floor. It helps during transmission as well. It means that, you know, the system will work quite happily above this level. It will only hear the transmitter. Uh, and then, yeah, anything below that just gets ignored. It will not transmit uh, any signal coming in below that threshold. Um, and it does mean that classic situation of someone turns off the transmitter and you get this rush of static through your system, which is not a good thing to have at a venue. No, no, you don't like big random bursts of sound. No. Um, so ultimately, the transmitter is trying to send as clean a modulated signal as possible, mm -hmm. and the receiver is trying to work with as clean a version of yeah. that modulated yeah. signal the, as possible. The receiver will just receive signal. It doesn't yeah. care. Um, and that's why we need to use things like Squelch to help it be aware that, you know, my transmitter is going to transmit at this amount of uh, level, uh, anything below that level, please ignore it because that's not my transmitter. That's something else. This is this is this this is the whole thing with RF. It can seem complicated, and, and to a point it is, but it's 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 much like it's much like a mixing console. Once you know one channel, how one channel strip on a mixing console works, you know how the whole mixing console works. Once you understand just a few small principles of being very aware of tuning in to an empty channel, 
that is as clean as you can possibly get it, which is why all, all of us as manufacturers, we put multiple um, preset channels and banks inside our systems so that you do have that option to move around.